This video is sponsored by the Sight Reading Factory. Use my code at checkout for 10% off your first year. Part one of this series was about the fundamental truth that the only way to get better at sight reading is sight reading. Part two was all about understanding the basics of notation and counting and inspecting a piece beforehand to prepare to read it. And part three was more intermediate and included tips like counting better with subdivision, making good use of the pencil, learning scales, and listening well so you don't get lost. This final installment includes a few tips that I'd consider to be a bit more advanced. But the first one really applies to every musician, and that is look ahead. You probably already do this when you're reading text. Although it may feel like your eyes scan along like a camera, they actually jump forward and back constantly, looking ahead and sometimes even behind to make sense of the ongoing narrative. But when we read music, we often do read like a camera, focusing only on the note we're playing right now, when we should be looking at and mentally preparing to play what's coming up next. Start small. When you're looking at whole notes, you don't need to look at the note that you're playing right now. Look at the note that's coming up. Then graduate to half notes, hopefully two or three at a time. Try to look a bar or two ahead. As you get better, your musical memory and pattern recognition will increase and you'll be able to look ahead further and memorize more material in more complex music. To practice this, take turns with a friend covering up a bar of music at a time as you're reading it. That way you have no choice but to look ahead, and you may find it easier than you think if you give it a try. Or, if you're signed up for the Sight Reading Factory, you can use Challenge Mode and turn on Disappearing Bars. Then just wait an extra bar after the count off and you'll be playing a bar that just disappeared. It's really an incredible exercise and will be a huge upgrade in your reading abilities. Tip number 14 is prioritize details. Music can be really, really detailed. And all these markings can be really important for making a piece sound beautiful and exciting. But sometimes you're just trying to survive, so you have to prioritize. Context matters and there are exceptions, but most of the time you want to prioritize rhythms, then notes, and then everything else. Most of the time, it's usually preferable to play the wrong note at the right time rather than the right note at the wrong time. If the piece is supposed to sound like this, but a couple of people play a wrong note, it's not so bad. But if even one person plays at the wrong time, it's just so much more obvious and disruptive. So do your best to play the right rhythm even if you do miss a note or two. Now for notes, if you're a wind player or a vocalist and you're worried about a section that's outside your comfortable range, keep in mind that it's usually more important to play the right letter name than the right absolute pitch. If you move a phrase or a note to a different octave, it may not be ideal, but it's probably better than missing completely and sounding terrible. If you're playing in a group and the music is really difficult, even if you're not able to execute all the notes, try to keep up reading and follow along. Because once you get past the really difficult section, you might be able to join back in. Don't give up. After rhythms and notes, there's everything else. All those little expression markings. And the truth is, if you miss some of them, it's maybe not the end of the world. It's still going to sound like the piece. But do keep your ears open and try to match style. If everyone else around you is playing short and soft and you play long and loud, you'll stick out and sound pretty bad. And speaking of prioritizing and being careful not to stick out, there may be times when it's so important not to make a mistake that you may choose not to play at all. If you're in a lesson, rehearsal, or practice session, it's not a huge deal if you make a mistake. These are the places to allow yourself to take chances. But if you're sight reading in a really critical situation, like a recording session, you might want to be cautious, because if you play badly, it can bleed into all the other mics and ruin the take for everybody. In the business, sometimes we say, when in doubt, lay out. Often it's better to just record your parts separately after the fact, and you can take a few tries if you need to. Tip number 15 is how to survive mixed meter. Mixed meter is when you see different time signatures mixed together. Sometimes it's relatively simple, and only the length of the bar changes. Other times the field changes between bars, like between duples and triplets. But it's fairly repetitive and you can adapt fairly quickly. But sometimes it's not simple at all. Mixed meter by its nature can be pretty unpredictable. But regardless of complexity, I've found the best way to survive through it is to stay in the moment and don't worry too much about context. If you're looking at music with changing bar lengths, just follow the quarter note pulse and subdivide when necessary. If you see longer notes, you might count them normally in the context of the bar, or you might just count the value of the notes themselves. It doesn't really matter that you know that this is on beats three, four, and five. You just need to know that it's three beats long when you get to it. If you're working with compound meter, follow the underlying triplet feel and play each beat as it comes. It takes practice and concentration, but just try to stay in the moment and execute each set of notes as they come. 
When mixing simple and compound meter, follow the underlying eighth note pulse throughout. That's how you'll keep your place and know how long each note is. And that's true for basically any combination of time signatures. Figure out the underlying pulse and follow that. Go slow, concentrate, and as always, practice. The more you do this, the easier it gets. Number 16 is composition and transcription. Although this series is about reading, I think there's something to be said for figuring things out from the other side. Figuring out how to write a song that's in your head or transcribe a lick or melody can be a great exercise to understand musical notation better. These days, notation programs make it easy because they'll play back what you write, and if you don't do it correctly, you'll hear the difference. If you don't want to invest in one of the big notation programs, they all have free versions with limited functionality. Or you can try a free open source option like MuseScore, which is pretty fully featured. Serious athletes cross train in activities other than their main sport, and musicians can do the same with composition, transcription, and so many more things, which are all highly recommended. Tip number 17 is identify your weaknesses and work on them. Being a good musician takes honesty. We all have things we're not great at, but if you want to actually improve, you have to face your fears. Whether it's keys, clefs, or anything else, the solution is pretty simple. Read that thing a lot if you want to get used to it. You can use the Sight Reading Factory to focus on any of those things, and the custom feature allows you to work on certain rhythms or restrict yourself to upper or lower registers and work on ledger lines. You can also challenge yourself by ramping down the difficulty but adding dynamics and articulation to make sure you're looking beyond just the notes and rhythms. If you think you've got most of those things under control, just push the tempo. Not only very fast, but try playing very slow to push the limits of your tempo control and mental focus. And of course, challenge mode with short prep time is a great option. You'll get a few seconds to study the music, and then you have to do your best to keep up with the playback. When you challenge yourself in these ways, your general reading abilities will increase substantially, and what used to be medium difficulty will feel much easier. Number 18 is Learn Movable Dough Solfege. Now this might upset some people because there are actually two kinds of solfege and many people hold strong opinions about it, usually preferring the version they learned first. Fixed Do Solfege is just another way to name notes. You can name this scale by using the letter names, or Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do. It's the exact same thing with different words. C is always Do, D is always Re, and so on. Movable Do is different. These notes are always known by their letter names but their solfege syllable changes depending what key you're in. In C major, C is Do, but if you're in a different key, like D major or E flat major, then the root note of those scales are assigned Do, and all the syllables follow afterwards. Now, this is a bit more complicated, and you have to know your scales well to make it work. But with practice, you start to see and hear notes as solfege syllables, and that's great because each one has a really specific sound about them in relation to the key center. You'll hear intervals better and develop relative pitch so you can transcribe and even sight sing music without hearing it first. And this can also really help brass players and string players pitch notes better because they need to be able to hear a note in order to place it correctly on their instrument. There are even special syllables for sharps and flats, and those syllables can really help train your ear because it's an extra level of association. Each one has a specific sound in relation to the key center, and the syllables can be very helpful to help you hear and identify them. And you can even turn on solfege annotations in the Sight Reading Factory. I highly recommend working on this. It made a huge difference to my ear training when I learned it in university, and it really increased my overall level of musicianship. Number 19 is Learn Music Theory. Many people think that music theory is about rules, and that it defines what music should and shouldn't be, but I think that's a misunderstanding. Music theory is about definitions and vocabulary. Being able to chunk large amounts of information into a few words makes it easy to communicate efficiently with other musicians. But it also helps with sight reading because you start to see those patterns and pieces. So you often don't need to read the individual notes, you just absorb entire passages all at once. Learning theory can feel overwhelming, but every little bit that you do absorb will make every other bit make more sense. I've done videos on most of the basics, so check my channel if there's anything you need to brush up on. Theory can be helpful with improvisation, transcription, and composition. Not because theory tells you what you should do, but it can help identify sounds you might want to use in your own pieces. Tip number 20 is practice technique. We've already talked about why you should learn your scales and music theory, and technique is closely related, but it's more practical on your instrument. Technique can refer to a number of different things, but in this case what I'm talking about is learning scales and arpeggios in every permutation that you possibly can. There are a million ways you can practice a major scale, and there are so many other types of scales too. As we've discussed, so much of music is just scales and parts of scales, but they can show up in a lot of different forms. The more versions you practice, the more likely you'll be able to not only recognize them, but execute them on your instrument easily. 
Finally, the last tip is practice sight reading everything. Tip number one in this series was the only way to get better at sight reading is by practicing sight reading. And now at the end of this series, it still couldn't be more true, and it's time to take it to the next level. We've already covered most of the obvious ways you should challenge your reading, and how you should work on your weaknesses. But have you ever tried reading music for another instrument? Or reading in a new clef? It's an incredibly mind-bending mental workout to orient yourself around an unfamiliar clef, and there are a number of reasons why you might consider it. Clefs can be useful for transposition. Pause here if you'd like to get a sense of how that works, and check back soon for a deep dive on this topic. Speaking of which, try transposing music into a different key, either just visually by imagining the notes on a different line or space, or by thinking in solfege and moving those syllables to a different key. This is a great exercise for key fluency. Also, try reading music in different styles. Every genre has its own rhythmic, melodic, and stylistic quirks, and learning to read them can really expand your comfort zone. You can even borrow music from one of your friends who plays a different instrument and figure out how to make it work on your own. And put yourself in situations where you have to read more. Join a community band or a choir. In the jazz world, there are bands known as reading bands. They rehearse regularly and read new music every week. Jazz players tend to be really good readers because they do a lot of sight reading. We've covered a lot in this series, from the most basic fundamentals to more abstract mental hacks. Some are quicker fixes and some are long-term projects. But if you're able to put these tips into practice, you're going to read with more accuracy and confidence. Special thanks to the Sight Reading Factory for sponsoring these videos. They really are a fantastic resource for accessing fresh new exercises to challenge your reading skills with. And the ability to customize exercises in so many different ways is fantastic. If you want to support the channel, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And even consider becoming a member of the channel here on YouTube or supporting me on Patreon. You can find links for that in the description below. Thanks for watching and happy sight reading!